I have to get them to clear it out of the firewall again. Uh, they keep blocking it on campus. Um, so, but at the top of my homepage is a link. However, you won't be in there unless you took classes last semester up here, free Microsoft, VMware and soft, Microsoft software. Um, so, all right, folks, let's start up again. And I'm glad I had a question, which is real important out there, which I forgot to tell you. Let me interrupt you guys. When you get your Kali machine running, you can type into it, but you can't copy and paste into it because every version of Kali, they keep breaking stuff. And now they broke VMware. Let me interrupt you guys so people around you can hear. They, now they broke VMware tools. VMware tools are what let you adjust your desktop. So let me show you what it is, and I will show you the workaround. Um, here's Kali. If you download the latest version, which is what I did, it looks like this. And um, originally, it won't let you resize the desktop, and it won't let you copy and paste text or files into it. So the workaround, which I recommend, is SSH. And I just added that to this page, your 123 page. Um, this is a good way to handle it. Um, right here, Kali 2017.3 fixes. And I'll put a break here so it's on a separate line. I just wrote this for my afternoon class. Um, here's, you can put on VM tools with these commands, and then you'll be able to resize the desktop. But you still won't be able to copy and paste commands in. Now, for the first couple of projects, you're typing in short commands, and it's all right. But pretty soon, you're putting in long blocks of text, and you really wish you could copy and paste. So here is a solution, which, by the way, is horribly insecure. You run an SSH server on your Kali machine and then connect over the network with SSH. If you leave it with a default password of Tor, then anybody on your network can use your machine. And that might be OK for our projects, but you should be aware in the real world, you should change the password and you should remove the default SSH certificates and replace them. And I have a link here that will help you do that process. But anyway. Once you've done it, and I've already done it to mine, if you have Kali here, you can, the way to see what's happening on your machine in network connections is netstat minus P-A-N-T. This is a very useful command. This will show you all the listening processes on your machine. So you'll see all the services. It gives you the port number and the name of the service. So you can see that my machine is listening on 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, which is 0, 0, 0, 0 is the arbitrary IP address. It's listening on every IP address on port 22. And the process that's listening is SSHD. SSH is intended to remotely control machines, and you'll use it to control cloud servers like Amazon servers all the time. And I've made my Kali into a cloud server effectively, although you can only access it from my local network. Um, and so now, to connect, if you're on a Mac or Linux, you just go to the command line and type SSH um, root at the IP address of your machine. Now, to find the IP address of your machine, it is down here. Another way to find it is IP adder show. That's the modern way to do it. The old way is a command called ifconfig that we were supposed to quit using, but everybody just keeps using it anyway. But anyway, it's 172.16.1.235. So I connect to 172.16.1.235. And the password is Tor, T-O-O-R. I haven't changed mine. And now I can copy and paste into this window to send commands to Kali. This is how I control my Kali most of the time now since they've broken VMware tools. Probably in some future update, they will get around to fixing their stinking VMware tools. But Kali breaks a lot with every version. It's a hacking distribution, and you have to have much lower standards of quality when you're dealing with hacking tools as opposed to commercial products. The developers just put in whatever they think is cool, and they really don't care if it breaks something you like very much. If you don't, they say, if you complain, they'll say, well, you should join the team and help us build it. Nobody's paying us to make this, so you can't like demand service, which is the thing about open source, right? Uh, anyway. So I put that on this page to help you with the projects. If you want to be able to copy and paste into your Kali, go to this Kali Fixes link that will show you how to set that up. I'm glad somebody asked. For the first couple projects, it doesn't really matter. But before long, it'll be very annoying that you can't copy and paste into the machine. Anyway, um, all right, so we're back to this stuff. Uh, we're past the first Kahoot. OK, so UDP. 
is the other layer um, transport layer protocol that is commonly used. This is when you want to just send data and you don't really care whether it gets there, which is not common, but it is appropriate for something like a live news stream. You may know if you get satellite TV, you can see raw news footage where they have the camera set up and the journalists aren't really ready and the peaker isn't really there. You see people setting up and putting on their tie and you often hear things they don't really want to say on camera. Uh, this is the same thing. You might have a security camera sending data over the internet. It'll typically just send it by UDP. This just sprays the data out and it doesn't know or care whether you're listening, like broadcast radio. They broadcast it. They don't even know if you're listening or not. They don't care. It's one way. That's UDP. It's therefore very fast. There's no handshake. There's no delay. It just sprays it out, but you don't know whether it got there. And if anything is defective, like if some packets are dropped, it does not detect them or fix it. You just have a defect in the display. That's it. Now, both TCP and UDP are transport layer protocols, so when they both use IP to get there. So the internet layer is what finds the physical location of machines, and that's an IP address called a logical address. ICMP is another protocol that can be used. Um, this is what you use to send a signal to a server just to see if it's there, typically a ping. This was the standard for a long time, but for the last 10 years, it's not worth much because Windows machines no longer answer pings by default. Um, so it is less useful than it used to be. The only thing you'll find with ping these days is Macs and Linux machines. Uh, you send a ping, you send an echo request, which is a type eight, and then you receive an echo reply, which is a type zero. It is something you commonly do. When you want to test a network connection, one good thing to know is you can do ping of google.com. Google answers pings. And if you see some packets coming back, that means you were able to send traffic all the way to Google and it answered. If your DNS is not working, but your internet is working, which happens pretty often on campus because our DNS servers are not much good, um, then you'll find that you can ping 8888, which is also a Google server, and it replies, but you might not be able to ping by the alphabetic name google.com, which means your network connectivity is correct, but your DNS server is not responding, so you cannot translate alphabetic names into numeric names. Anyway, um, that's a common test just to see if networking is working. Now let me show you a couple of these things in Wireshark. So if I start and uh, stop this, start a new session, okay, no interface selected, all right. What's going on here? Capture options, okay, on the Wi-Fi. Start, okay. Now I'm showing everything. I'm gonna filter for ICMP, which is ping. And now I'm seeing nothing because there are no pings going. Your adapter is always sending out a bunch of background traffic. Um, things looking for updates, things checking to see if servers are there automatically. So if you don't filter, you'll see a lot of stuff scrolling by. So now when I ping 8.8.8.8, I'll see it in Wireshark. So this is a very simple protocol. I have a ping request followed by a ping reply. Another ping request followed by another ping reply. Now here, you can see how Wireshark works. The top line is a summary of every package. The details are in two lower panes. The first pane down here shows you the model layers. This is the physical layer, how many bytes on the wire, although it's wireless. This is Ethernet that sent it to MAC addresses with these 48-byte uh, MAC addresses that are six bytes. Here's the IP layer, and above that is ICMP. That's what a ping looks like. And you can expand it here and see pieces of the protocol, like here's the time to live flag, and someplace down here will be the flags like SYN. Oh, not in this protocol. That's IP. Anyway, this is how Wireshark shows you the layers, and if you really want to get down to the nitty-gritty, this is the raw binary data that was sent by the packet. This is it in hexadecimal, so this is exactly bit by bit what was sent over the network. And here's one interpretation of it field by field, and up here is a sort of summary of the whole packet in one line. So if I start sniffing again, and I filter for HTTP, for example, and then I refresh that insecure page I was using, and I'll just type it in again, AD, there we go. All right, that makes you some HTTP traffic. So let's look at that. This is an HTTP get. So it's a more complicated packet than a ping. And you can see down at the bottom, it's a lot longer. It has a lot more binary down here. 
If you look in the middle, you can see all the fields that are used to make it. So it's 493 bytes. At Ethernet 2, it went from my Mac to the Hewlett Packard switch. All packets going to the internet do that. They have to go to the device in the room that goes to the internet. And that's all layer two does is reach the right device. That's right, it's above that door, that white thing. That is the router that takes out of the room. So that's what this is. Then, I think it's actually a switch on the way to that router. But anyway, then the IP is here going from my 147, 144, which is our city college address range. So those are physically on campus, all those addresses, over to my server, which is, uh, I think actually San Francisco, but I don't know, it might be in New York, it's a cloud server. And here's the ports. So this is the Ethernet layer, IP layer, and this is the transport layer, and this is layer seven. Layer seven has the message, and the message is get, tealeaf.gif, HTTP, that's getting the background image for my page. And this is an HTTP get, about which we'll talk more in a later chapter, and quite a lot in the 129S class. This is how you do the web. You send requests, which are about 10 lines of text, and you get replies, which have headers and then content, and it sent a cookie up to my server. There are cookies used by a lot of these things. So that's what's going on. You have layers. This is very much like sending, uh, you want to send something to somebody, so you put it in a box, in an envelope, then you put the envelope in a bigger envelope, then you put the envelope in a box. Or you look at a real address for a human. You have a zip code, which is the general location, you have a street address, which is the house, and then you have a name, which is the person in the house. So here we have an IP address to find the physical location, an ethernet address to find the mail exit port from my local area network, and then at the higher level I have a port number, which tells it which particular process on that server I want to connect to. Because one server can be serving many things, videos, emails, chats, files, and other things. So anyway, that's, that's how it works. Everything on the internet has three addresses. And um, that's ICMP in Wireshark. Uh, there's a movie about this stuff. I'm not gonna play it. I don't think it's that informative. It's kind of fun though. Um, all right, so IP addresses. Uh, the most common version of IP is the older version called IP version four, and that has these four numbers. The numbers are actually base 10, which is pretty much a mistake, but that's become a tradition. So they only go from zero to 255. Really, they are a base 10 representation of eight bits. And if you don't know binary, you should learn it. I made it an extra credit project in this game. There are some binary games. You, if you don't know binary, you might as well give it a shot. I tried to make it as fun as possible. Uh, binary is important. If you try to do computing without knowing binary, you are like a musician that can't read music. You can get by for a while, but you will constantly be humiliated by everyone thinking you know this thing that you really ought to know. And if you make it to a higher level, like Cisco networking, you really have to know it. So um, I'll probably uh, introduce that a little later, let you go through it. Uh, the original system for IP addresses divided, it, well, this was like the second update, actually, because IP version 4 was classful until, I think, 1993. And so the first half of the address range the first byte going from 1 to 127 was class A, which are huge networks that use the other three bytes to specify individual devices on the network, so each network could have 16 million devices. Then class B, like City College, has two bytes to specify the, the physical location, which is 147, 144, and the last two bytes we can use to number individual devices in the company. The most common type is a class C network, which goes from 192 to 223, where the first three bytes determine what company you're at, and you can only vary the last one byte. That's called classful addressing, and the internet has not worked this way since 1993, but a lot of the later protocols rely on this system. That's why it's still worth knowing. So that's class A, the first byte is network, and the next three bytes are called nodes. They are different devices at the same company. Class B has two network bytes, and two node bytes. So City College has 147.144.00 to 147.144.255.255. So that's 65,000 possible addresses, all of which will be here under our control. All the internet routers look at is the first two bytes. That determines then what company we're going to, and they route it to there and then drop it off. Just like the post office just brings a big tray of mail and just dumps it in one place, our mail room, and they say, there, it's up to you to sort it internally. That's the internet traffic works the same way. 
So class C, you have three bytes of network and one byte of node. So you only have 254 possible hosts. Hosts, anything with an IP address is called a host because long ago it was a server serving many people. Now, even if it's a cell phone or a printer, it's still called a host. And you can't use the address zero, that's all zeros in the host, because that's used in the routing table to refer to the whole network. And you can't put all ones in the host portion because that's considered the broadcast address to refer to everything. So if you have one byte to vary, instead of being able to address 256 devices, you can only address 254 devices. I was at DEF CON and they had Hacker Jeopardy. And the last question asked this, and the official answer they accepted and let somebody won was wrong by two for this reason. I was in the back screaming, wait, wait, that's wrong. But they didn't hear me in the crowd. I felt ripped off. Anyway, um, that's what academics are for. They know the little picky details and other people don't really care. They, the winning answer was 1,024. And it should have been 1,022. But anyway, um, so this system limited you to only 2 million companies on the internet and was too small. So as the internet grew in 1993 or so, they expanded to CIDR. And this is CIDR. CIDR is where you split the network up into more than just three categories. So this subnet mask of 255000 means the first, where the subnet mask has a one in binary, it is a network bit. Where it has a zero, it is a host bit. So this 255 is eight ones in binary. So the first eight bits are one and all the rest of the bits are zero. This is what's called class A. So in the world of CIDR, you call that slash eight because there are 32 bits in the address and the first eight are the network bits. Then you call class B a slash 16 because the first two eight groups of eight bits are network bytes. And if you have three bytes of network, you call it a slash 24. And the reason you do that, of course, is now you can make networks in between, like a slash 22 and a slash 28 and a slash 14. And that's the way the real internet works now. It cuts it up into all possible sizes. And if you can't convert base 10 to base 2, you will never get this straight. And if you take the Cisco exam, at least one third of the exam or a quarter of it consists of questions that require you to be good at this. You have a network, they say, what's wrong with this network? And if you knew your binary, you'd know that this device is actually not addressed properly to be on that network. This is a very common problem. People get confused and can't quite figure out what addresses go to what addresses until they get good at turning decimal to binary. So that's the game. Um, all right, the subnet mask is used to specify how big the network is. The slash number means the same thing as the subnet mask. It's just another way to write down the same thing. IP version six is the upgrade to IP version four because even though we expanded the number of available devices by switching to CIDR, classless interdomain routing, with that slash number, that still wasn't good enough and we ran out of those. So the internet ran out of addresses about uh, 2012 or so for North America and we switched to IP version six. And that IP addresses are now really long. They're four times as long. So there are an unbelievable number of them. Why, 256 billion, 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 billion. So we have enough addresses now that we're not going to have to go to IP version 7 anytime soon, but the addresses are now really long. Eight fields, each of which is four hexadecimal characters. At least they don't use base 10 anymore. It's hex. All right. So there's these binary games, and I think, yeah, we're late enough. All I'm going to do today is show you the first binary game, and I think I'm not going to do those cahoots. I'm going to Let's see, I wonder if I can do this. All right, I'll stick with my Kahoot's. I'll try these binary games next time because I'm gonna try to figure out how to integrate that with Kahoot, probably what I should do. Because the online viewers aren't gonna be able to do it. Um, you can make extra credit by doing these binary games and I'm gonna try and integrate them into the class, but I can't do it tonight. I have to think about how they're gonna fit. Anyway, here's a couple other systems. Binary uses just zeros and ones and eight bits per byte. Hexadecimal uses four bits for a nibble, and that turns into one character, which is 16 possibilities, zero to nine, and letters A through F. So one character stands for, eight, for four bits. And base 64 uses six bits for every character. So three letters with eight bits turns into four letters in base 64. It's used to send binary files by email and as a really lousy form of encrypting things so that it's hard to read them.
you end up with, it uses the capital letters, the lowercase letters, the numbers, and then two more symbols, often plus and minus or plus and slash. And so here's Oracle. Oracle in ASCII uses a eight bits per character. So you run them all together and then group them by six. So you take the 010011 here, and then you take the 11 from the O plus the first four bits of the R, 0101, and put it here. Group them by six, then look them up on that list of 64 characters. So Oracle turns into capital T1, capital J, capital B. You'll see this stuff. You get long strings of meaningless letters, but it has capital, lowercase, and numbers. That's page 64. If it just has numbers and letters A through F, that's base 16, hexadecimal. And it's good to get used to these. You see these all the time in cookies on the internet, all over the place. And you'll, have, you'll see them in the projects. you see them in Wireshark. These are common representations of data. And you should get to where you can understand data in any of these formats. And the binary games are a way to practice those skills. So I got another set of cahoots, and that'll be the end of this lecture. And I'll think about how to integrate the binary games into my modern system. Why is my computer not responding? Ah, there we are. All right, so someplace around here should be cahoots. There is one. Cahoots, life is good. Okay. All right. Okay. There's the magic cahoot number. Good, people are coming in pretty fast. I bet I can wait another 10 seconds and I'll have everybody that's coming. Maybe not. All right, I'll wait a little bit longer. My afternoon class has 222 students signed up, so I don't know how many of them are gonna be on the Zoom. We're gonna see what it can handle. It doesn't mean they're all gonna come to the lecture and live stream, but I don't know. We'll see how many people Kahoot can handle, how many people Zoom can handle. <laughs> All right. I'll wait another 10 seconds. Nine. All right. Six questions. Okay, what protocol sends echo requests? Trying to get out of the way. All right, that's ICMP, Internet Control Message Protocol. All right, looks like the winner had no name at all. All right, so which one of these is Class A? All right, 2345 is class A. If the first number is below 128, it's class A. The one in yellow is no good because it has five numbers. You're only allowed to have four numbers in an IPv4 class four address, uh, IP address. All right, so what's the network portion of that address? That's the address of our web server. All right, the first two bytes, because 147 is class B, so that's it. 147, 144 determines that it's a city college address, 
and the rest of it determines which particular city college device it is. And like I say, that is our web server, although there is no way for you to tell that just from the number. The only way to tell what it is would be to scan it. All right. How many bits does it take to put ABCD in ASCII? Which is the normal way you encode characters. Okay, it's 32, the way it's normally encoded, one byte per character. By the way, if you are super pedantic, you could say 28, because actually only seven bits in the byte are used for ASCII, but that is beyond the detail level required for this course. But anyway, 32 is the best answer of the available choices. Four bytes, each with eight bits, so 32 total bits. Always watch whenever you have this kind of question whether you're looking for bits or bytes. All right. How many base 64 characters does it take to encode ABC? Okay, it takes four because you count the number of bits. You have three characters. There's eight bits in each one, so that's 24 bits. Base64 uses six bits at a time, so it's six times four. Three groups of eight turn into four groups of six. That's how it works. So it is four. All right, how many bits are there in that hexadecimal value? All right, and that's 32 bits. Each letter is four bits, so that's four times eight. So let me just demonstrate the binary games because I see quite a few people getting these wrong, and that's why I wrote them, so you can practice binary. So let me just record these winners, and then I'll demonstrate those games, and you can do them for extra credit. So, by the way, there's a minor confidentiality issue. People giving me their names, I'm not able to hide it totally from the broadcast and recording, so uh, I'll try and find a way to improve that. But uh, Shiki, Deng, and Derek. All right, I can probably figure out who those people are. Anyway, let's take a look at the um, binary games. Extra credit projects are your best friend, of course. You do enough of them, you don't have to take the final and such. So here's the binary games. Let me just show you how it works. It's just going to ask you some questions. So there's a lesson which explains it. So let me just, let's look at the nibble lesson and then the nibble game. The nibble lesson has got just a couple of slides here. So here's how nibbles work. In base 10, these are normal numbers. If I write 147, I mean 100, four tens, and seven. And we learned that in fourth grade or something, and now we're used to it. But the way it works is the number on the right is the number of ones, or 10 to the zero. The next one is the number of 10 to the one. Next one is the number of 10 to the twos. And it's base 10, because there are a total of 10 symbols. So binary, that's how this works. You have ones, tens, and hundreds in base 10. But in binary, you only have two symbols, zero and one. So the base is two. So the number, if one, one is three, because the number on the right is the number of two to the zeros, which is one. The next one is the number of twos. So it's one, two, plus one, one. So if you have a three, place binary number. The one on the right is the number of ones, the next number is the number of twos, and the next number is the number of fours. And if you have a nibble, which is half of a byte, it is four of these. So here's how you count to seven in binary. Zero is zero, one is one, two is one zero, because it's a two plus zero, because there is no symbol for two. One one is three, one zero zero is four. This is no ones, no twos, and a four. And seven is 111, the highest possible three bit number, which is 11 plus 12 plus 14. And if you make a nibble with four bits, 
So this is the number of ones, the number of twos, the number of fours, and the number of eights. And nibbles, that's all there are, just four bits. It's an object that is half the size of a byte. So you can write down all the nibbles, and that's all of them. So 111 is 7, and 1111 is 15, and the nibbles only go from 0 to 15. And this is important to know. This is how you do a lot of binary. This is how you do hexadecimal. You group your bits four at a time and interpret them this way. So 8 is 1000 because it's 8 plus no fours, no twos, and no ones. This is 9, 8 plus 1. One thing that's handy to remember is that 10 is 1010 10, because it's 1 8 and 1 2 and nothing else. And 10 11 is 1. Here's another fun fact the odd numbers are odd in both systems. The even numbers all end in 0, the odd numbers all end in 1. Um, and you, learn, you can learn to add and subtract in base 2 and such. It's really quite simple. Anyway, so once you've looked at that, here's the game you do with it to earn extra credit. Um, so you convert this thing 101 to decimal. So what is it called out? Five, five right? It, this is a 1 and a 4, so that's 5. Okay, now I have one correct. 10, 10, what's that? 10, there you go. And what about that one? Two, okay. When you get 10 correct, you'll win, and then you turn in the screenshot saying you got 10 correct, and it's worth five points. And there's about eight of these covering different parts of binary. So if you didn't do well on the binary cahoots, this is intended to be an easy way to practice. And I might be able to, I used to do this in class with iClickers, and I haven't quite figured out how to integrate it with Kahoot, but I probably could. I'll work on it. But whether I manage to make it an official Kahoot part of the class or not, you can make a bunch of credit here. You can learn all these things. And it's a good thing to know. Then getting good at binary will serve you as you go ahead. Yeah. Any, any questions about anything? All right. I'm going to stop the recording. And um, I'll go up to the lab and help anybody that wants help in 2.14. Uh, it's already noon. Right. I have noon to 1. I'll be up there. And uh, if anybody needs ad codes, I've got them. Yeah. It's not meeting today because all those people are competing. Right now, the collegiate cyber defense competition is running. It started at 8.30 and it runs till 3.30. They are now visibly, they're locked in 2.15. And I even, it's quite a big event. This is the one that really counts. This is where we beat every other college in the last one. And, but Stanford went from number one to number four. So I think they're sore. So I think we're going to have trouble beating Stanford this time. But anyway, they're doing it. Okay, so I'll be in the lab for about an hour, and then I'll be back here at one to teach a different class. But the lab will stay open. Yeah.